Now this is a suction throttling valve. We don't see these anymore. They were on air conditioning systems back in the 70s. And what we're talking about today is uh, the, and when you've got, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the suction line coming out of the evaporator just get coated with ice. Well, the, air, the evaporator can get coated with ice too. And one thing we don't want the evaporator to do is turn into a block of ice so it blocks the air. And so how are we going to keep it from doing that? Uh, well, on this one here, the compressor ran all the time when the AC control head was set to AC or even defrost to dehumidify the air. And on some luxury models, the compressor just ran all the time. And this suction throttling valve basically had a, a piping the refrigerant so that it went it, it bypassed the evaporator, basically the way I see it anyway. You're probably never going to see one of these. We did change one one time on the, uh, the uh, 71 El Dorado that belongs to the public president. But uh, pressure equalization port to expansion valve, old bleed line, so on and so forth. You know, this right here, this didn't, these didn't have an accumulator on them. They was a totally different kind of system. Now see the frozen evaporator core there? We don't want an evaporator to freeze up. The POA valve works in conjunction with the expansion valve to drop high pressure warm liquid refrigerant to a low pressure cold, but keep the cold liquid from getting so cold it'll freeze. So preventing it from turning into a block of ice is really important. We don't want that to happen. So then we just totally lose all of our cooling. Now expansion valve only systems change the size of the liquid line orifice. You know we talk about a fixed orifice. The fixed orifice is that little plastic filter that goes in there that's got a screen in it. And a lot of the time you can tell if something's been trying to come apart in there if you pull that fixed orifice out and you see stuff in there. Or you can sometimes when you pull the uh, some of the lines loose if you see little balls of desiccant in there that look like little tiny marbles, that means that you basically have an evaporator, I mean a uh, dryer coming apart. Uh, now these have a thermistor measuring temperature of the evaporator a lot of the times too. Uh, what they do is a little thermistor is actually going to change its resistance based on temperature and it's hooked up to a, a little block that will turn the compressor off and on. So the whole thing is all about keeping the evaporator from freezing up. All right, so this is what your orifice is used. Let's fix the orifice tubes. Whenever you're putting them back in there, they got various different size orifices in there. And you're supposed to put one in there that's the same color as the one you pulled out. Right? In other words, if an orange one came out, you need to put an orange one back. If a green one came out, you put a green one back. And so, you remember how they fit? How many of you have pulled one of these out? All right. So, uh, I mean, that's basically the, the one that on the Oldsmobile has the one that's fairly easy to pull out, you know. But that's something you need to understand. And an experienced air conditioner mechanic will actually take that, or I mean, they'll, they'll you know, uh, test the refrigerant, pull it out. They'll get that orifice out and see what's in there. See what, it, see what the screen has caught. And if it's got a lot of pieces of nylon and stuff in it that came out of the compressor, you know, uh, piston seal, they know they got, you know, burgeoning compressor problems and all that. Now, orifice tube systems have got low pressure cutout switches that cycle the compressor off when the low side pressure drops below a certain threshold, usually about 25 PFI. If you're watching those pressures, you know, like you're going to start out, what's your static pressure usually going to be? You remember? When you checked it, you were checking your static pressure on that Nissan the other day. You didn't have any static pressure because there was your refrigerant identifier told you there was refrigerant in it, but when you put your gauges up, there was no pressure. I mean, it, it had started to go atmospheric. If you've got a bad enough leak where all the refrigerant is gone and it's nothing but air, and listen very carefully because I've had people that I've said this to and they nodded their heads and then they did something stupid. If there's nothing in there but air, or if you've had a maybe you've, Maybe if you pull the refrigerator out and you've changed an accumulator or something, you're putting it back together and you're getting ready to uh, you know, charge it back up with the refrigerator. What do you, which button do you push on the machine as far as vacuum, recover, what do you do? Right. It's full of atmosphere. You're vacuuming. Right. You do not recover air because whatever you recover goes back into my refrigerant tank. You got that? Yes. And I have seen people that have been in here a whole semester and done a lot of air conditioner work, changed out of something like an accumulator, all that whole system full of atmosphere, and the guy pushes recover. And it starts recovering the air into my refrigerator tank. Then I gotta take care of that problem. But anyway, all right, this protects the compressor, improves fuel economy, and prevents evaporator icing. You see these little switches are all different kind of switches. Now some of those switches 
we're going to be sending a signal to the engine controller because the engine controller will feed voltage out to it or actually feed voltage out then it'll whenever it's closed voltage will go through it to the other you know back to the engine controller or whatever this kind right here see that strange kind of thing little threads on it or nothing yes. that kind will go, that's a high pressure switch that goes in the compressor a lot of times you'll get a compressor on some of the older ones and you'll see a high pressure switch in there and those are color coded too but you'll have to take a little snap ring out and there's o-ring around that and you pull that thing out of the compressor but in most cases, if it's got a lot of miles on it, that funky little thing won't come out of the compressor and you've got to get the parts out send you another one just because you can't get that one out or if you do try to get it out, you'll bust it trying to get it out there because it's been in there too long. Good idea to replace it anyway. I don't know why they don't send one with a compressor other than the fact that they're color coded. There'll be green ones, there'll be blue ones. You've got to put one back in there the same color and all that. You notice also a lot of these switches Always know what you're dealing with because a lot of these switches right here have got a little Schrader valve underneath them so that you can actually just screw the switch off and screw a new one back on without, you know, evacuating the system. Your dad's stuff like that. But the Cadillac y'all were working on the other day is not like that. Now there's also an O-ring around that. You can create a leak if you're not careful by really wrinkling the O-ring when you're screwing one of these on there. See what I mean? So you don't, any kind of a leak is going to empty the refrigerant. You're going to be in bad shape. All right. So vehicles with downsized engines got smaller. The feel of the AC compressor switching on and off tends to be annoying. You know, you can feel it kick on and off and all that. So bigger cars, <coughs> you didn't notice it in much lower cars you did. Now compressors got littler and lighter. This is a scroll type compressor. We talked about that a little bit before. This is one that actually has a little solenoid that changes the angle of this plate. And it doesn't even, it's shown, this is shown with a clutch on here, but basically these won't have a clutch. They'll spin all the time. And what changes whether the compressor is working or not is the angle of this plate, which is basically changed by a controller based on what it wants to see. So if it doesn't want a lot of compressing going on, instead of cycling the compressor off, it just changes the angle of that plate so the pistons aren't moving. They're not going back and forth, they're just spinning around. All right. This one here is one of, who was that who took your compressor apart and I spun it with the drill? Was that you and yeah, Kayla? Jennifer. Or you and Jennifer? Yeah, y'all. I spun it with the drill and you can see those pistons going back and forth in there, right? You know that? Uh, anybody that hadn't took a compressor apart needs to because that's really cool stuff in there. You know, you got the little... Uh, I took one apart with the Yeah, I know. You ruined it. Yeah, yeah it, you Kayla that one for sure. All right, the variable displacement compressor was born to keep passengers cool while reducing the load on the engine. Uh, and no clutch necessary, but the pulley's designed to break away and freewheel if something locks up or if the pressure goes too high or whatever else happens. And so you may see one where this little center part broke away in there, and you'll have to take measures to do that. You know, follow your shop manual procedures on that. Um, now, wobble plates versus swatch plates. The old compressor, how many of you seen a compressor like that? Made by Frigidaire originally, GM cars used to have them on it. Some of the Fords had them on it. Uh, the early Ford back in the early 70s. The A6 compressor had a fixed angle swash plate, wobble back and forth to cause the six pistons to move their full stroke at all times. But either old compressor weighed more than 30 pounds and required a lot of energy to turn. You could curl that thing and you know build you some biceps. All right. Variable displacement axial compressors, the heart of them is a variable angle wobble plate. And some of them are internally controlled, and some are externally controlled, some are electronic PCM controlled, and some are pressure controlled. Now, I was at a, the uh, Max convention when I took this, and there's a really cool air conditioning company, don't mind the pun, called Ranchu. And everything they have is all pink. All their stuff is pink. You see the pinkness behind there? Uh, but they know their stuff on air conditioner stuff. And uh, they had uh, some, uh, I was telling, uh, asked one of my technical editor for the magazine, I said, where do they get all these uh, attractive girls to dress up in these frou-frous to stand around in all those pink stuff? Oh, those are models that they hire from some agency and all that. And I said, so I asked that girl, I said, so you work for a model of agency? She says, no, I work in the office. They just gave me this to wear to this convention. <laughs> but it looked like an Indian thing. And I says, did y'all go there from Reno, Nevada? And I says, is that something they gave you from the casino or something? She goes, heck no, we had to get this made down in Florida. It's a strange thing, but it looked like something you'd see them wearing at a casino, although you know, I don't typically go to casinos. Well, the wobble plate is nearly 90 degrees in relationship with the input shaft. It has very little wobble to it. See that little control valve? Now it changes that. You can go back and work your old piston in there. 
aren't, uh, that, well, you got the piston is telling how much the stroke is. If the piston is not moving back and forth in there, it's not going to have any pressure. Effect. A single shaft with a brass wishing for the plate to angle back and forth on uh, keeps the plate, you know, that's action control. It's not hard to understand. Now, there are some troubleshooting stuff you're going to have to know how to do what you have to do them. Now, if a variable displacement compressor wobble plate gets stuck in a lower displacement position, uh, cooler will be cooler and the high and low side pressure will be as low as if you had a low charge or a bad compressor. So you're looking at your, what does it look like when you got a bad compressor? What do your pressures look like? The pressures start out static, which would be about 100 PSI on each side, 70 to 100 PSI. And uh, basically what you'll have is they won't, what they're supposed to do is go opposite directions when they compressor running. But if they stay really close, like if this one is up about 70 and this other one over here is up about 95, the compressor's crap. Or if you got one of these kinds, you may have the frozen wobble plate. If the wobble plate gets stuck in a high display position, you have the restricted or frozen evaporator. Um, uh, and the, the red drive clutch is locked to the compressor gap with a shear pin or hard rubber mount. And that's a little close up of it. It's half break. So now these right here, like I said, they don't have a clutch, they spin all the time. Because low charges and overcharges can emulate other problems. Your time we had to do a recovery and recharge with the correct amount of switch instead of face left down. On some of the uh, Ford, uh, they got a compressor anti-slugging strategy. And what that means is the compressor is down low, so a lot of the oil may drain down over compressors. You can't compress the oil. So you want to kind of move it out of the way before you start spinning the compressor full speed. And so whenever you first start it up, when you're spinning it over, it's got the compressor energized and it's turning it slowly with the starter to pump that oil out of there. They call it CASS, something Ford does. I don't know if anybody else does it or not. Compressor anti-slugging strategy. If it's full of oil, let's see if it's down low in the system. You can see how the oil will puddle in there, right? And that's just a little something I thought I had. After the recover recharge, if you don't see any spots freezing, which would indicate a restriction, it appears the compressor is not pumping any or throttling back to create too much of a drop. On the low side, you may have a compressor displacement control problem, and that's your little Google water plate. Uh, if the displacement control is electronic, you want to check that out prior to going out the compressor. Now. If the variable displacement control valve is mechanical, you got two choices. First choice is to try a new control valve. Not usually on that hard to change. Most of them will go with the second choice, you know, put a compressor on it. If the compressor is noisy, or the inlet screen, or orifice tree screw, reveals some nasty metal and debris, you replace the compressor. If I'm going to put a screen, in, uh, a screen in one to keep metal filings that came off of the old compressor from getting in there, where would I put it? Like, let's say the system's got metal and stuff in it, we flushed it as good as we can with our flush machine, but we want to make sure in as much as possible that we're not going to pull any metal in there and mess up a new compressor. So if you were going to put a screen in that system, where would you put the screen? The lungs of it. The, the suction side. Back in the, in the suction side of the line so that whatever's, whatever's coming out of the compressor gets stopped in that screen. And you know, back in the day when I, uh, I had done some air conditioning work but not that much, they would have crossed or had one of these V piston compressors on it like in the late 70s and uh, the compressor came apart and locked it up and all that kind of stuff. And I just threw a compressor on it and a dryer and figured it'd be a hate. Well that compressor lasted about a half a day and it started knocking too. So I called the parts store over there at Spence Battery in Port Arthur and I said, hey, well, this compressor started knocking. He said, well, the metal that came out of the other one, where did it go? I said, well, I guess it's, ooh, it's all through the system, isn't it? You know, I didn't think about that. And he said, that's got to be flushed out of there or you're going to keep having trouble. And so I did some sort of radical. I took all of the lines loose, the compressor off and all that, and the lever dryer off, and I poured that whole system full of denatured alcohol. It was basically a, a chemical called Delco D-Clean. I don't think you can buy any more. Sort of purple dyed stuff for flushing brakes and whatever. Of course, it ain't good to flush brakes with alcohol anymore because you'll make, mess up your ADF smell. But anyway, I poured it all full of there, and I stuck a hose on the outer part of it so that it could go into a white clean white bucket and I put a little bit of air pressure on there and I blew all of that alcohol through there because it washed that oil out of there and everything and it went into the bucket and you see all kinds of metal filings and everything going in there. I did that two or three times until nothing but clean came out of there and I re-oiled it, put another compressor on it, juiced it back up we were in Fat City. We went right there. Now that was just thinking outside the box, you know. Sometimes when my dad was pillowing my mom's air conditioner, he would just take her back to mine, hook it up to the engine and put a fitting on it, or let the engine idle a little bit, and you got about 20 inches of vacuum there, and let it vacuum it out, and then you put the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, if you understand how that works, you can do stuff. That's an orifice tube that 
I was holding in my hand right there. You probably will recognize that as the tip of my thumb if you know my thumb there. All right, some AC specialists might consider replacing a control valve that could be done without removing a compressor. That's what it looks like. If they decide to go that route, it's smart to give the customer a mild warning and say, we're going to try this, don't know if it's going to work or not. Uh, but it's $289.95. Alright, a typical clutch bearing in coil weighs about as much as a laptop computer. Uh, so subtract the weight of the pulley and doing away with the clutch drops two or three pounds from the car. So they're constantly trying to make cars lighter and lighter. The advantage of a consistent load comes into play when the clutch is gone, but a little bit of penalty in winter for a little more drag. And there got to be protection mechanism, such as the shear pins uh, to allow the, and this right here is actually a normal clutch and coil and all. Yeah, but anyway, so on and so forth. Electronic control of variable uh, displacement side of the compressor is more common. GM's adopted a CVC solenoid, though in Toyota done the same thing. Scan tool pins for the newer compressors display duty cycle percentage for the solenoid control of the compressor. Now, you won't be totally clueless if you're going to look at something like that. Alright? If you can't read that pin on your scanner, grab a digital multimeter with a duty cycle function. You've got to have one with a duty cycle function, which is Hertz. And watch the percentage increase as you dial down the temperature on the control head. So watch the percentage, turn it down, and you'll all be able to tell if something's going on there or not. Now, if it's not responding to that, then you've got issues there. The pin for the compressor displacement solenoid is played on the data stream and current, which corresponds to the average cycle time of the solenoid. Uh, the DTC sets that the pressure doesn't match the solenoid's commanded state. But basically, anytime you got computers controlling something, they're going to get feedback and they're going to see what is, is it hitting the target? You know, I'm going to put a target there. Like, when, remember, whenever you did your idle air control with the scan tool, you take your idle air control or your EGR or whatever, and you say you want it to go to this percentage on transmissions on the GMC, you basically can go in there and you're going to set your, you know, change the amps that's being delivered to the, uh, uh, pressure control solenoid to watch the pressure change. So there's a target it's looking for, and what it'll do is, is and I want this to go to this particular reading, and then I'm going to dial it up to that, and if it can't hit it, it throws you a code. It says, I'm shooting for this target, I can't hit it, something's wrong. That's the performance deal. Electric compressors are the standard for a lot of hybrids, but 05 to 09 Ford Escape Mercury Mariner still use a mechanical compressor just like everything else in it. Some Hondas have a compressor to two-thirds mechanical belt driven, with the remaining rear third of the compressor being an orange cable. If you see orange cables under there, it's going to be hundreds of volts going through the orange cable, so don't bite it or stick your tongue in there or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, all these early Fords and the GM VASC assist belt alternator starter, that's a big motor that's on the front and whenever you stop it kills the, like a golf cart, you ever drive a golf cart, you give it the gas, it takes it fires up and takes off. That's kind of the way those work. Now that way you're not idling when you're sitting still. See what I mean? All right, so if you've got a customer that complains of insufficient coolant or reduced fuel economy, uh, the, that's a little scroll type compressor there. Just educate yourself on how it works, all right? Uh, these belts, the alternator starter system, use a bicolored LED to indicate economy or max AC compressor modes. So in the economy mode, the in, internal combustion engine will enter idle stop, shuts off the engine. As the refrigerant warms up from lack of circulation and evaporator temp sensor signals the HVAC control the evaporator is getting too warm, then the PCM commands the engine to fire up. Uh, the in, in, the uh, ice and mechanical compressor restarts and is back to staying cool. I might notice a drop in coolant performance through max compressor mode only when it's idle stop. If you turn it all the way on max, the engine's going on all the time. That's on all of these, right? On max AC, you're always going to have the engine running. You're going to do the idle stop. 12 volts is fine for an electric water pump, but it's not sufficient for power in an electric AC compressor. Have you ever seen a vehicle with an electric water pump on it? You know, they won't have the, all the water pumps won't be electric. Typically, they'll be just one, like on a Nissan Pathfinder. Or I mean, let's see, what's that thing? The one that we had out there, Pathfinder Xterra, it's got a water pump in the heater hose to help it, you know. Uh, anyway, after electric vehicles supporting 100 or more volts are perfect candidates for the uh, corporate effort fuel economy stretching an electric AC compressor and they can run with the internal combustion engine off. A little growling sound from these high-speed motorized compressors is normal. Now, there are three and four pounds of R12 in some of the older vehicles that common. What's the most you've ever had to put in one that we worked on here? You remember? Huh? The most refrigerants you've ever had to put in one that we worked on here, because y'all have done a bunch of AC work this summer, or some of y'all have. 
one point nine. Yeah. Well, you did one point nine. We had actually had a remember the suburban. I mean the expedition that we did. Anyway, it was like three pounds, three and a half, something like that. So a system with lightweight heat exchangers like the newer parallel flow condenser usually use about a pound or less. A J2788 machine is necessary for those systems, which is a okay. Anybody got any questions about that? Mm -mm. That wobble plate, that wasn't on the uh, light tube, it was just the swash plate. Mm -hmm. Just the swash plate was on the light tube. Mm -hmm. You mean the one that, you talking about the one that changes? The swash plate and the wobble plate are more close to the same thing. Basically. I mean, if you change the angle of that thing, it makes the piston move more and all. But uh, like the one that we took apart, like me and you and her, did that. You know, all that. One time I was talking to this guy out there and he said, My air conditioner is not putting out on my Chevrolet pickup. And so uh, I didn't have anything to check it really, except for I took a unplugged the low pressure recycling switch there at the accumulator and I, you know, just jumped it with a little piece of wire that I had there and it kicked on and it started getting cold and all that. And, and um, he said, Hey, that's cool. And uh, he said, uh, What do I need to do? So he put one of the switches on there. And that's what was wrong with it. And, um, now, there used to be on some of these had an adjustment on that switch, a little screw down in between the terminals you could turn, you know. But anyway, he said, well, how much do I owe you? I said, that'd be $65. He said, what? All you do is jump a wire. And that's the old saying, I'll do his wire to jump, though, and you didn't, you know. So anyway, I didn't charge him anything. I just didn't way and all that. But uh, there was a, uh, a girl that had a little Volkswagen bug. Um, it's a, not, a, not the old bug, but, the, you know, the newer bug. And she had a little fan on the dash blowing in her face next to a picture of her mama and um, she was driving around just burning up one summer and she says I went to there when they were going to have a condenser and it's going to be four hundred dollars and I ain't got four hundred dollars and so what we had was a condenser the pipe that comes off the condenser was going through a little metal strap you know they put a strap around put a screw through it and hold it still and right there above that strap that little thing had broke had cracked and the refrigerator was coming out. That would be part of the condenser. And um, so I said, okay, I think we can do something with this. So we took that strap off of it and we went ahead and let it separate it apart. And we got a copper tubing union and put on there, tightened it up, and pulled it down, and charged it up. And she had cold air. <laughs> $3 or whatever. But the long and the short of it is, uh, did, you, did you guys see the one I posted in that uh, Facebook message box about a piece of hose? Or is that? If somebody took a, there was a uh, evaporator that had, uh, I mean, had, no, excuse me, a condenser that had two tubular things, and somebody clipped all them things out of where they had a leak there, and they put a, put tubes in there. I mean, a piece of hose in there with two hose clamps on either side, you know. And I put it on my technical writer page, and they were saying, uh, this is really impressive. <laughs> and somebody was able to pull that off. Well, he forged like the leak right there where the, a little pipe goes into the end of the condenser, so be aware of that. You know what I mean? And uh, like basically, if you're looking for dye problems, uh, and, and we've actually seen that too. And there was another uh, little quickie I was going to tell you about too, but I don't remember what it was now. Anyway, I had it in my mind just a second ago, but it went somewhere when I was thinking about the other thing. Um, anybody got any questions? You need to put Did Tim it? in that Snapchat, in that group chat. In that group chat. He's not in it. No one. Yeah. And Sierra's Sierra's not either. Sierra, yeah. No way yet. Yeah. Well, in order to put those in there, they got to be on my Facebook page. You know. I put Sierra. Sierra in there. You're in there. Sierra. You can put Sierra in there. Yeah. yeah. You want to be in that? Yeah. It's automotive. And basically, we just post automotive pictures and stuff like that. That kind of thing. And uh, or you know, funny pictures and stuff people do in their car. Like there was yeah, one in there where somebody had uh, had that. You know, they put their tie rod in up there and they put a. A sheetrock screw through it to hold it in without even having a nut on it. You know. Is your best fellow with Sierra as? <laughs> yeah, C. C, like the old mobile Sierra. That's what that is. <laughs>